Good evening, everyone. My name is Carrie Barnes. I'm one of the elders here at Stonecrest. I uh, serve along with Harrell Thomas, Anthony Brooks, and Isaac Nixon. We have uh, three deacons here, and we're delighted to be in the midst of the Lord's people. Uh, before I get started in my lesson, what I want to do is, is recall I was talking to a dear friend and we, was gotten, we had gotten on the subject about if the Lord's will. And I referred him to the book of James, the fourth chapter in the verses number 15. There, the Bible teaches us that we should not take things for granted. We should not actually take our life for granted, like everything going to be all right. But we got to realize that we're only here because of the Lord's will. I can't tell you. If I'm going to be living five minutes from now or five seconds from now. But I know if the Lord's will it, it's going to be all right. Now, why is that important dealing with my lesson? I'm glad you asked that question. It's important because whatever we do for the Lord, we need to make sure that we stay within his will and his confinements. Because God is so gracious. He's blessed every. And each and every one of us to allow our golden moments to continue to roll on just a little while longer. Uh, I want to thank Brother Barclay, uh, who's actually right now at home suffering from a, a common injury that he has uh, periodically, which is dealing with that sciatic nerve. But he allowed me to stand here in his stead, something that I do not take lightly, but I take it seriously. And in my teaching, I want to let you know that what I do, I try to give people remedies and antidote on how to deal with the everyday resuscitutes of life. So I chose a subject tonight to talk about. I call it the six things Satan wants for your life. Uh, now, when he wants those six things in your life, uh, he wants those because he knows. That if you die in your sins, Jesus said, where I am, you cannot come. Now, in teaching this Bible class, I want to call your attention to Acts, the eighth chapter, around the 31st verse. There, when Philip had joined the Ethiopian unit, the question was asked by the, Philip, understanding what thou readeth. And the Ethiopian unit replied, how can I? except some man teaches me. What I want to use as a leapfrog in this lesson is that how can we learn how to deal with the adversaries unless someone teaches us? So tonight, I want to give you these six points. These six points is to elevate the Lord and not praise Satan. We're not here to praise Satan. We're here to identify him for who he really is. So if you get nothing else out of this lesson, take these six points, put them to heart, and know that God wants you to be warned because he don't want you to have to ask that question later on. How can I understand unless someone teaches me? So devil into the lesson, I want you to see uh, that the enemy has a plan for our lives. The adversary wants to steal, kill, and destroy us. But God calls for us to be alert and sober-minded. Watch out for the schemes of the devil, who prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to destroy, according to 1 Peter, the chapter is 5, and the verse is number 8. The devil wants to destroy our lives. He wants to keep us from the joy of living in a relationship with Jesus. Now, the six things the devil wants for your life. Number one, he wants for you to doubt God, for you to live in fear, for you to feel insecure, for you to avoid the church, for you to be led astray, and last and certainly not least, he wants you to fail. Let's look at each one of these individually. 
in John, the 20th chapter, the disciples shouted that, that they had seen Jesus raised from the, the grave. All right? Believing the miracle of salvation. But however, Jesus appeared also to the one that we call Doubting Thomas. And he, Doubting Thomas doubted that Jesus had risen from the grave. The Lord asked us to stop doubting and believe in him, according to John, the 20th chapter, and the verses number 27. So when we doubt in the Lord, all it does is lessen us from being faithful to God. I like the saying that I use a lot is that where doubts begin, faith ends. When doubt increases, faith decreases. So we got to have the faith in the Lord that God will never do anything to cause us to have to doubt him. So as doubting Thomas, he was one of those that said, Lord, if I can put my hands on you, then I believe that you was raised from the dead. So the adversary wants us to doubt the Lord. Now God has done too many things in our lives for us to have to doubt him. God laid the foundations of the earth. In the book of Job, Job questioned God. But God asked him, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Job's wife asked him, why don't you cuss God and die? But Job had the fortitude and the sense to say, you speak like a foolish person. So let's not doubt God because when we doubt God, we lessen his power in our lives. And the adversary wants you to lease your power, less your power in the Lord, because when you lessen your power in the Lord, it decreases your hope and it increases your doubt. One other illustration I want to give you dealing with this subject matter. When sometimes we pray to God and we ask God to do things in our lives, but what we do, we get off of our knees and we pick the situation right back up. When God has the situation in his control, you've given it to him through prayer and supplication. When you give it to him in prayer and supplication, there's no need for you to go back and pick up that which God has already taken up. Now remember, God does not respond on our time. He responds on his time. So just because you have not gotten the answer that you thought you were going to get. Remember, he's always on time. Remember that God is a way maker. Remember that God has you and your concerns in his hands. God answers us in three ways. His answer could be yes to your request. It could be no to your request. Or he can say not right now. So before you start doubting in God, remember that you might be at a not right now time. Because he don't see that you're ready to receive that which you are asking for. There are people that ask the Lord for a million dollars. But the Lord said you're not even doing right with the hundred that I've given you. So let's stop doubting God. Because when we doubt God, that gives room for the adversary to get the victory in your life. Now point number two. The adversary wants you to live in fear. Now, I want to let you know that fear is the absence of faith. It is the misplacement of faith. The devil doesn't want to rob us of our faith. He wants our faith to be in anything but God. You know, I can stop right there with this lesson if I needed to. Because when we put our faith in anything other than God, think about what you're saying. We got faith in our automobiles. We got faith in our jobs. We got faith in everything else except the one that it should be in. Oh, yesterday and uh, uh, the other day, that is not yesterday, I, I was dealing in a Bible class and I was telling people how we go to sleep at night. We wake up the next morning, we get in our automobiles, drive down the interstate. 60, 70 miles per hour, not knowing that the brakes are going to work. But then when we get to a point where we need to use the brakes, then we mash them and thank God that they work. 
We have sometimes have more faith in the automobile than the man who holds our lives in the ball of his hands. So let's stop having fear and start having more faith in God. Because God is never going to give you a challenge that you can't handle. I remember what the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 13. He said, there's no temptation that's not common. In other words, there's nothing that we go through in this life that someone else has not already dealt with. We're going through COVID right now. Well, they had the black plague years ago. Uh, you may be going through financial difficulties, but you're not the first one to go through these difficulties. You may be going through sickness and seem like you just can't get well. You're not the first one that's going through a sickness. You may be dealing with your children just not want to act right. You're not the first one to have children that don't want to act right. Whatever your situation is, you got to keep your faith strong in the Lord. Because when you start doubting the Lord, that's when your fear will set in. Now, there's a fear that you can't do something. There's a fear that you're afraid of something. But the fear that we have to have in the Lord is a fear of respect. A respect for his awesomeness. Because God can do far more and exceedingly than abundantly anything that we can imagine. He allows this whole world of the living to inhale and exhale all throughout life. Certainly the God that we serve can do far more exceedingly than anything that we can imagine. The psalm that said it in Psalm 34 in the verse number four. He said, I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Are you seeking the Lord today? Are you holding on to the Lord today? Are you holding on to the begging elements of this world? Because the beggar elements of this world will tell you to trust in all the devices that God has allowed man to have. Now, there's nothing wrong with the devices, but there's certainly wrong with sometimes the way we use these devices. Social media could be one of the greatest instruments for the delivering of God's words. However, the misuse of Facebook can cause it to be do great harm to the mission of the Lord. So we can do things great with our technology, but let's not let our technology do great things with us. Let's always remember the devices that God has given us to use for his glory. Let's continue to use it to tell his story. The third thing I want to discuss with you on tonight, for Satan want you to feel insecure. Now, insecure is a strong word. Uh, when a person is feeling insecure, it's like feeling not sure of yourselves. I remember when I was in the military and we had to go through some difficult drills. There was a huge object that we had to get across. And number one, I was not a great one of heights. In fact, one time I had a fear of heights. You probably say, well, why would a man that has a fear of heights want to jump out of an airplane? Well, one thing I learned in life is that you got to overcome your insecurities. Now, I'm not saying that everything that you face as an insecurity, that you got to put yourself through the test. But what I'm saying with your insecurities, you got to trust the man that can make your insecurities become securities. Don't let the devil tell you that you are unloved or not good enough. You are God's handiwork. And Christ, we are not only good enough in Christ, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. The Bible tells us that God will never leave us nor will he forsake us. So why are we having such great fears with the things in life? Why are we dealing with the resuscitation of life knowing that we got one that sits high 
and look low. We got one that sits at the right hand of God, petitioning on our behalf. We got one that says, Lord, forgive him one more time. We got one that goes to the Lord and says, Lord, help him through this. We got one that says, Lord, just help him through this situation because he, Father, needs you right now. We thank God for Jesus. Jesus went to the cross, even though in Matthew chapter 26, he says that, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. But if not, let thy will be done. Praise the mighty name of Jesus because he was obedient to the cross. He didn't let the begging elements of this world, the insecurities of this world, hinder him from doing the will of the Father. I thank God that he can deliver me from all the things and the resuscitates of life that cause me to feel sometimes not sure-footed. But I'm glad that I can stand tonight. I can stand flat-footed on the word of God. Flat-footed means I put all my weight on his word because I know he's able to deliver me through no matter what that I may be facing in life. And then he wants on point four for you to avoid the church. I want to put a dime in the middle right here because I want to let uh, remind most of us that the church is a hospital. It's a hospital for all of us that are sick. What are we sick from? We're sick from sin. Even though we've been born again, sometimes we still slip, stumble, and fall. But thank God that he's given us the hospital. When you're going through difficulties in life, why are you worrying about running away from the church? You're running away from your only ark of security. That's why the Hebrew writer wrote in Hebrews chapter 10, the verse number 25, when he was saying, forsaking yourself of the assembly. Uh, we always talk about that part, but the part that we miss is that it's for exhortation. We can exhort one another. I don't know what you've been going through, but you maybe have gone through something that I have gone through, and that can help me through my situation. Praise God for the assembling of the saints together, because when I hear you give a testimony, I know that God is in the neighborhood, because God has delivered you off your sick bed, God brought you through your financial difficulties. God allowed your children to make it back home safely for whatever the determined thing they was going through. God is still delivering his people. So what I challenge you today is don't avoid the church. That's your rescue place. Some people say, call it, that's your safety button. You can push that button on the Lord's day. You can call your minister, you can call your elders, you can talk to your deacons. We're here to help you make it through your situation. We're here to pray for you. We're here to give you all that you stand in need of because we know that there are trying times that come in all our lives. But if we pull together, God will bring us through. I want to give you a short illustration if I may have take this point. When we was in the military, we was taught to march with every left foot hidden down at the same time and every right foot hidden down at the same time. So at nighttime, when we're in a combat situation, all our left foot feet, that is, hidden down at the same time, and all our right feet hidden down at the same time, it sounds like to the enemy, there's only one person marching it or coming through those woods. They can't hear the multitude of feet because we're walking in unison. And when we're walking in unison, there's strength. When we're joined forces together for some, a common goal like we were in the military, there's strength in that. So please, don't give room for the adversary. The more uninvolved you become, 
with the body of Christ, it's that much harder to pre persevere in your faith. It isn't easy to follow Jesus in a world that doesn't. When we lead the community we were made for, we we're destined to be devoured. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I just want to let you know is that we're always here for your service. The Bible tells us that who, let he that is cheapest among you be servant of all. We're here to serve. We're here to work. We want to put our hands to the plow. And we challenge you to work with us as we come to this hospital, this place of refuge, that we all can be delivered from our trials, our tribulations, our sins, and everything that we face in our lives. Now, another thing that Satan wants you to do, he wants you to be led astray. Let me tell you, if I put a dime in the middle again, being led astray. Uh, on the screen, you can read it for yourselves. It says, watch out for false prophets. They come to us in cheap clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves, Matthew 7 and verse number 15. When we rely on the words of men or ourselves in place of God's word, we can lead others away from Jesus. Uh, please, I beg you, I plead to you, uh, don't be led away from the truth of God's words. Because sometimes we got great speakers. Now, I know some of these talk show hosts. I don't want to start calling names because some of them may be your favorite uh, show hosts. But I know of one particular show host that was giving advice on marriage, and she never been married herself. She came to get the man that she'd been dating for over 20 years to marry her. Ah, uh, They got one show with a talk show host that calls himself a, a psychologist, giving advice, and his own marriage is messed up. In fact, the man been divorced over four times. Now, if you want good advice, come to that hospital. Come to that place a refuge because there you can get the advice where we got people uh, in the audience been married 20, 30, 40, 50 years or longer. And they've been living it according to God's word. That's the advice that you want. Just referring back to the military, when I was in the military uh, and was a private, I didn't hang around with people that was privates. I hung around with people that were sergeants or higher ranking because I wanted to know how they made it that I could make it too. So I advise you, listening to the world is not the place. Listening to those wolves in sheep clothing is not the one. But listen to every word of God that's preached and remember to do what Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 and 15, he reminded Timothy to study to show thyself approved. A workman needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So learn God's word for yourself. And I strongly advise you to get into a Bible study class. We got an excellent evangelism class taught by Brother Les. Carter, I teach the adult Bible class. I'm not bragging on myself, but I think I do a fairly well job. And then we got uh, Elder Brooks, who's teaching our marriage class. We got a, a roots class. And there's so many other individual or specialized classes that we don't mind setting up for you. Even if you're trying to study, set up for a Bible class. If you don't know how, to do the Bible class, we'll be glad to teach you. Or we'll be glad to do the Bible class for you. The one thing I don't want you to do is be led astray. Because when you're led astray, that's when the enemy plays with your mind. 
which is your heart. He leads you down roads that lead to destruction. And you, he leads you to places that you don't know need to be. So when you're laid astray, always remember as the prodigal son did. One son stayed home with his father, but another son decided to go out and got his possessions. He went out and he spent all that he had. When he spent all that he had, he was about to eat the food that the hogs eat. Now, if you know Jewish customs, Jews do not eat swine. Now, he wasn't eating the swine. He had gotten so low that he was going to eat what the swine eat. And back in the days when I was coming up, that was slop. He was about to eat that. But thank God, he came to his senses and realized that back home at his father's place, that there was much food, there was... There was everything that he needed. So he went back home. The Bible tells us that his father saw him from afar off and ran to him, put his robe on him, gave him his ring, and told his servants to prepare the fattest cow because the son that had left home has not came back home. Well, Brother Bond, what are you saying that for? Because we have some who have strayed away from the faith. But I'm telling you that sometimes the, say, the devil will hold you out there alone the longer than you intended. Then you get the feeling of embarrassment that if I come back home, people are just going to be talking about me. People are just going to be saying that, look, look at him now. He's back here. So you're embarrassed. But what I'm saying to you is that we're going to welcome you like the father welcomed his son. We're going to treat you with so much love. Because there's one that's been snatched back from the fiery hands of the adversary and came back to the Lord. Because when you're in the wilderness, you've been led astray. When you've been in the wilderness, there's no peace with God. When you're in the wilderness, you can't defend yourself. When you're in the wilderness, you're too far from the ark of safety. So remember, it's okay to come back home. And I just want to touch briefly on, on the other son. The other son who stayed home got upset. That represents that even when some people come back home, there may be some of us in the church may get upset. But I want to challenge you that let's love our brother. Let's love our sisters who strayed away from the faith. Because it's not our business. You remember what Paul said, that God adds to the church as it pleases him, not us. This situation is bigger than us because we never know when ourselves may stumble and need to be reconciled back unto the Lord. And then the step that I purposely put in this position right here is that the adversary wants to see you fail because the devil wants to destroy us, church. Because when he destroys us, you remember what Jesus says. He said, if you die in your sins, where I am, you cannot come. The adversary wants you to die in your sins because he knows that where Jesus is, you cannot come. He wants us to settle for what the world has given us and accept our lots. But Jesus came that you can have life and have life more abundantly. He didn't come here for you to perish. That's why one of the favorite scriptures in my life is written in John 3 and 16. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians. 
chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. He said, we are hard pressed on every side. We are also not, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, wow, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our bodies. When you feel like you're going to lose, take heart. Jesus already won the battle for you. Don't, don't want to be destroyed, devoured. Stop doubting and believe. And just a few closing words in the lesson to be yours. The Savior came here to redeem us because we could not redeem ourselves. Going back to the book of Genesis, starting with Adam and Eve. When Eve was tempted by the serpent, go back and read your Bibles, Eve was not by herself with the serpent. Adam was there. Adam had been taught by Jesus because it was Adam that heard the voice of the Lord. And when he heard the voice of the Lord, he knew what he had to do. So it was Adam's responsibility to teach Eve. And in teaching Eve, he was to help her understand the commandments of God. While he was standing there listening to the serpent do the things to Eve, he failed to speak up. Well, Brother Bond, where are you going with this? I'm saying we have an obligation to speak up and speak the truth. When we know the adversary is racking upon the members of the church, let's not sit back and be silent. Let's speak up. Let's speak up. Let's not go through the wilderness as man had the journey when Adam and Eve was put out the Garden of Eden and a flaming fire was put at the entrance. Man walked for years and years and years and years for redemption. But there was no one without sin that could be redeemed. But then came Jesus who was put in human flesh, according to John chapter 1 in the verses number 14. And he dwelt amongst men. He walked this earth some 33 years. Did not sin. Was faced with temptations, but did not yield to those temptations. That hung up on that cross who sacrificed that we all can have eternal life, that the Father's will could be done. Now he has been called back to glory. As I stated earlier, sitting at the right hand of the Father, mediating between God and us. Let's not let that be in vain. Let us continue to hold on to that faith that's been delivered through the apostolic doctrine. We can hold on to the end knowing that God has our lives in the ball of his hands. God will never leave us. He won't forsake us. He will answer our prayers according to his will. So let's continue to march towards heaven. Let's continue to hold on to the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Let us continue to encourage one another. Let's not leave our brothers and sisters out there to be destroyed by the enemy because if they don't hear the truth, there's another story they can hear. And I bring this lesson to a close. I want to give you a short story. There was an old man and his wife driving in the truck. He was driving in the truck and the old man had both hands on the steering wheel looking straight forward. And his wife looked over to him and she said, honey, you know we don't sit close under each other like we used to. 
The old man never taking his eyes off the road and never taking his hands off the steering wheel. He replied to his wife, I'm still sitting where I always sit. I say that he was where he was. The wife did not realize that she had slid over. So church, I'm saying that sometimes we don't know that we've gotten ourselves a guilty distance from the Lord. We can use this night right now to come back to the Lord by repenting of our sins. And if you're not a child of God, I just want to give you the steps real quickly to you. First, you must hear the word, believe that what you've heard, repent of your sins, confess the sweetest name on mortal tongue that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God, and submit yourself to the water of grave of baptism when you come up a new creature in Christ Jesus. If you just want prayer, we got a number that you can request prayer. You can go online and submit a prayer. Because we here at Stonecrest believe, as James says, in the effectual fervent prayers of the righteous avail it much. Whatever your needs are, you can let them be known. If you want to submit to a Bible study, we're glad to do that. If you stand somewhere else across this great United States or, or in this world, period, just call us and we'll put you in line with a congregation in the area that you're residing in. Well, the lesson is yours. And I bid you a good night and pray that God continue to hold you in the ball of his hand and that you continue to hold on to those unchanging hands. Thank you and may God continue to bless you.